Here we go. Well, welcome everyone to day two of the Next Health Summit. We are thrilled to be with you and couldn't be happier. This is a deep passion of Sean and I's as Sean has been in 30 years of corporate wellness, has traveled all over the world. I'll let him tell you a little bit about his background. And we had the privilege of working together for about a decade with the Daniel Plan. I had the honor to serve there as the founding director and Sean pioneered our fitness. We co-authored the best-selling Daniel Plan book, 40 Days to a Healthier You. And it's really our heart's desire to share any tips and tools that have helped us along the journey and that we have seen be transformative in other people's lives. And that's the reason of us launching our next health summit. So good to be with you, Dee, and everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on day two. And dear friend, it's been a privilege and a blessing to serve with you over all these years. And this is a, a monumental um, event, guys. We've been working on this summit for months. And oh my gosh, the, the experts that have, have been a part of our journey. Because of Dee Eastman, I have had the privilege of meeting so many people from just her sphere of influence with the Daniel plan and then being involved in the Daniel plan. But I also was in corporate wellness. I still am involved in corporate wellness for over 30 years. And I, I need to tell you guys, and this is something that I share um, often, when you're in the health and wellness field, there's nothing, I, in my opinion, there's nothing more rewarding than helping someone um, improve their own personal health and wellness. But what Dee and I realized, at least I know for myself, Many of the things that, that we're gonna be sharing throughout the week, I desperately needed in my own life. And so that was one of the reasons why both Dee and I started Rise Together because we really felt like we needed to make wellness simple. There's so much information out there, right guys? I mean, some, many of you are coaches, many of you are, are you're in the health and wellness field, but Dee and I really have made it our goal to make wellness simple. How do we make, how do we curate all of this information that's out there and distill it into information that is usable, actionable. And so we were our own first clients. We, we really realized in our own lives that we wanted to improve and change our own lives. So we're thrilled. We cannot tell you how thrilled we are that um, you're here with us. And we really hope and pray that this just isn't information coming your way. We really hope that you're gonna be able to take just one or two things from each session, write them down, We'd love to hear from you. Um, in fact, D, if you don't mind, I'm going to make a quick plug. On Facebook, on our Rise Together Today Facebook page, we'd love to have you post what you're planning to do from this session. And every time you post, you get entered into a drawing. D, we're going to be giving away some Try Best blenders. We're going to be giving away some really cool, I think we've got a juicer that we're going to be giving away at the end of the week. So the more times you post on Facebook, the more you get entered into the drawing. So post at will. We'd love to hear from you guys. So yes, and as we queue up Dr. Mark Hyman, I just want to say Dr. Hyman really had a transformational impact in my life. When I met him that first week of the Daniel plan, he's so charismatic. He's so insightful. He has, I don't know how many best-selling books out now, 10, 15. Um, his late, latest one that we'll talk about in the interview is the Pegan Diet. But, you know, at that time, I have five grown kids. I have a set of triplets. I had had numerous gut issues on my own, which led me down to a rabbit trail of different health challenges. And my one daughter, Megan, has a more, um, more intense form of cerebral palsy and is in a wheelchair. And with all of the dynamics that come with that, she had a lot of gut issues as well. And Mark just changed it for all of us. We changed our diet. I had no idea at that point, gosh, like 12 years ago that I was gluten intolerant and dairy intolerant. So was Megan. Um, so I just want you to know that the things that we're passing on today, we've been profoundly touched by ourselves, our families, and in our coaching program, it's the bedrock of our nutrition protocol as in our RISE coaching, our 10-day detox, and our 21-day program. So with that, I just want to say Hold on to your horses. Mark Hyman has so many great things to say. And Sean, I'll let you go ahead and queue up that interview. Yes. And you please guys may have in chat. If there's one takeaway that comes up that you like or you have a question on anything, please feel free. We'll be staying in the chat the entire hour. I was just going to say you guys may be introduced to some of our family members that are often behind us. 
So <laughs> yeah, you can see Bella. I have Bella and Bear in the house right now. I'm sure they'll be wanting to make That's a full awesome. debut. And you may meet Sophie in a little bit. She comes and joins me often. So hope you don't mind, but we have our, our fun family members that come in and join us. So um, with, with that, guys, we'll come back after the interview and please hang out. We want to talk with you a little bit more about next steps. So um, we'd love to be with you. So hang on for just a second. And I'm going to go to share my screen. And here we go, guys. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. We are super excited about uh, an opportunity to meet with a dear friend, uh, Dr. Mark Hyman. We're just thrilled to be with you, Mark. Can't, so uh, happy, Mark. Yeah, but really, it's such a privilege to be with you. Welcome. Welcome. It's been 11 years. No, 10 years. It's been amazing. This is 10 years, the Daniel plan. Wow. wow. That was an amazing 10 years. <clears throat> yeah. I'm so happy to. I mean, you've become much more than a friend and colleague. You've become like a family friend. And we Absolutely. adore you and are so endlessly proud of you. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, just such a, you have such a big heart and soul and your desire to help others is so palatable from just first meeting you. It was like when I first met you back at Saddleback Church, it was just like, oh my gosh, I want to get to know this team. Oh, this yeah. like such a big impact in the world. So we just want to say thank you for sharing your goodness, your insight, your heart, your joy, your love. And we're really excited to be able to just have a great, I'm pretending I'm sitting down with a cup of coffee and we're just having a great time interacting today. Yes. Okay. Coffee or tea or maybe yeah, green juice. Green juice, juice, green juice, maybe. <laughs> not, a, not a frappuccino, I hope. <laughs> and Mark, you know, not not like you need this, not a formal introduction. I think most people know who you are, but for those of who may not know all that you've accomplished, and gosh, you've done so much for so many hundreds of thousands of millions of people around the world. Um, i just like to share a little bit about you. So... Dr. Mark Hyman is truly leading a health revolution, one revolving around using food as medicine. I love that word. Uh, to support longevity, energy, mental clarity, happiness, and so much more. Um, Dr. Hyman is a practicing family physician and internationally recognized leader, speaker, educator, and advocate in the field of functional medicine, which we hope to talk with you about today, Mark. Mm. He's the founder and director of the Ultra Wellness Center, the head of strategy and innovation of the Cleveland Clinic and the Center for Functional Medicine. And oh my goodness, Mark, 14 times New York Times. 14. <laughs> yeah, one, of them was, one of them was the Daniel plan. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. That counts. Yeah. So, you know, Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. And we're so looking forward to just chatting with you. And like Dee said, you're such a dear friend. And uh, thank you. Thanks for the time together. Of course. My pleasure. I, I'm fully committed more than ever to the Daniel Plan and what it stands for, which is about love and community and helping each other live better lives. And that is just where we have to go because we are in big doo-doo with our current healthcare situation. <laughs> big doo-doo. Okay, well, I, I, mean, I mean, honestly, I just saw today the headline was that life expectancy has gone down worse than it's th since, since World War II. And, and it's because of COVID, which is because of our diet, which is because of, you know, our whole food system. And what shocked me, uh, Dean and Sean, was that 63%, well, 63.5% of all hospitalizations from COVID were because of poor diet. So think about that for a minute. If we could, you know, and, 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 and a bunch of the mo and people who, went to hospital, many of them died. Eight, you know, 600,000 people have died. So when you think about what is 63% less deaths, that's a lot. <laughs> and we wouldn't be in the situation we're in if we didn't have this horrible food system that's driving our poor health. And, you know, when we did the Daniel plan and we launched, it was so exciting because all of a sudden at Saddleback, everything changed. The refinery changed, what was available was changed. There were no more pancake breakfasts and ice cream socials. People were jogging for Jesus and doing farms and, you know, no more, you know, men's breakfast with ribs and stuff. <laughs> and, you know, there was a little Coke here or there I could find if I hunted and gathered around, but mostly all that was gone and people took to it and 
did so well and they lost so much weight and not only weight but i just remember one so many things like one woman came up to me after like the six weeks the initial program and she said doctor i mean i've been depressed my whole life i've been on in and out of psychiatric hospitals my marriage is failing i don't think i can work anymore i was about to get fired i'm on so many medications i've been in and out of psychiatric hospitals and she looked at me she says this is at six weeks she says, is it possible that this food could cure my depression in three days because she was better in three days <laughs> and i'm like yeah and then she lost like 45 pounds in six weeks she was happier than she ever been she was off her medications so it's really not just about the weight loss it's about it's about the underlying issues that you fix by focusing on the five principles of the daniel plan faith food fitness focus and and friends <laughs> <laughs> friends, friends is probably the first one <laughs> i call it the love diet it, yeah it's all about the love diet well i'm going to switch us over mark to speaker view so people can get a closer view of you and launch you with a question off that 63 percent is pretty staggering and i have a quote i'd like to read from you that says the most powerful medicine is at the end of your fork food is more powerful than anything in your medicine cabinet and we love that quote. It's what you stand for, the food of medicine. So share a little bit about your personal health and nutrition journey and what sparked your interest in studying the impact of food and how functional medicine can have an impact on one's health. We'd love to hear kind of a personal side of what are you interested in the beginning? Yeah. And what have you really uh, seen by making some shifts with nutrition? You know, you know, we, we, we can't always tell the trajectory of our life looking forward, right? But we can connect the dots looking backward. And now when I look back at my life, I'm like, it's obvious that I'm doing what I'm doing now because I had set the stage early on. I, I you know, for my first visit to my sister, I was 15, I visited her in college in Amherst and there was a veggie room and people were eating all this healthy food and they had uh, this really thick, like dense, delicious, fresh, like whole wheat bread. And they had this crunchy peanut butter that was unprocessed and they had honey and I was like, I had that. I'm like, oh, I'm never going back. This is so good. <laughs> and I became a vegetarian for 10 years. And then I, in college, I moved into a house with a group of people. And one of them was a PhD nutrition student at Cornell who was studying the bugs in the gut and ruminants, basically fiber and infect on my, the microbiome. They didn't even call it back then. And he was super into nutrition, nutrition science, got me very interested in it. And we cooked together every night. We, we, every, it was great because we had like eight people in the house. So we never, we never went without a home cooked meal and you didn't have to cook every night. You just had to cook one, one day a week and you wear a helper one day a week. And so you got really amazing food and it was all vegetarian at the time. We were in Ithaca, we had Musa cookbook. And I learned how to cook better and I learned how to think all the ingredients and I learned about making them from scratch and making bread and making, we made maple syrup. We had, we had maple trees in the front of our house and we like tapped the maple trees and we got like one little pint of maple syrup that we each <laughs> would eat by the spoonful, you know? <laughs> I did not know this about you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so that really set me up. I mean, I, and, it, and, and Peter, the, the nutrition guy who, who was still, is a, was a professor, became a professor of nutrition at uh, University of Buffalo. Um, he gave me a book called Nutrition Against Disease, uh, which was really uh, written by Roger Williams, who was in the 50s, was discovered, you know, some of the vitamins, and he wrote a book about biochemical individuality. And it was the first time I really began to think about how food could be used to treat disease. And this was back in the 70s. This is like, this is way, way, way long ago. And I took nutrition class at college. So I was already set up to think about it. And I already was set up to think about systems. I studied, you know, systems theory. And I studied ecology and I just I had the brain that was ready for understanding that, that, you know, there's a different way of thinking about health and disease. And then I got really sick uh, and I, I went to medical school and I got brainwashed you know, pretty well. Uh, and I was, I was a good traditional doctor, but uh, I knew something was missing and I ended up getting very sick from mercury poisoning from going to China and that led to a total system breakdown. And then I had to really think about what to do. Long well, story short, I discovered functional medicine at the time which I thought was just, you know, established field, but it was really just beginning, really. And the Institute was established in 1991. You know, I kind of picked it up in 97. So it just sort of got going. And I learned how the body actually works. I learned the, the way it's truly designed and, and how we can begin to work with the body rather than against it to create health, whether... We can look at how the body functions, hence the word functional medicine, as opposed to just 
the diseases. So my job isn't really to diagnose and treat disease. My job is to find out where the imbalances in function are and help people regain that function, whether it's in their immune system or their digestive system or their hormones or their detox system or their brain chemistry, uh, the structural system. And I, and it really is so much, so much of it is really what we, we, we do ourselves. So I would say 80% of our health is not what happens at the doctor's office. <laughs> You know, diabetes isn't cured in the kitchen. I mean, it isn't cured in the doctor's office or the hospital. It's cured in the kitchen, in the grocery store, on the farm. And so I began to just think big, more in a big picture way about everything. And then I started to use food as medicine, which was just shocking to me to see. Like, I would, I would start out and say, okay, well, you know, migraines. And maybe, maybe you've got some food sensitivities. Let's just do an elimination diet and see. You know, you've had migraines for 40 years. And you've been in bed half the, you know, half the month. Like, let's just try this. You know, it can't hurt. And people go, oh, I'm cured. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> or they say, I've, you know, was, one guy came up to me at Cleveland Clinic and he said, I have rheumatoid arthritis. Is it possible that just doing the 10 day detox diet, just 10 days that my, all my pain inflammation was gone? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, and so I began to hear these stories and just, I was incredulous because it was out of my framework. I, I, even though I believed it was true, I didn't know how powerful it was. <laughs> and, I, you know, I don't even, I can even share a story of a patient who just, you know, was just so transformative. Um, and we had so many of those cases that, but it was hers was so striking, uh, which was. Do you, know, do you mind if I show a picture? Or, no, I, don't. Or, I, I can. I can share it. I'll, I'll share it uh, uh, if you give me permission. I can share something. And she was so sick, and and you know we didn't have that many medical appointments left because we were we were so busy at Cleveland Clinic, but we ended up um, we ended up having this group model which by the way, it was modeled after the Daniel plan. So he designed a secular version of the Daniel plan for the, the patients there to get in. And I'm just going to share uh, her, her case now. So this is, this is Janice. You can see um, she's quite overweight. <laughs> All right, we'll just do a full screen here so you can see. Uh, she's quite overweight. And she um, had diabetes on insulin for 10 years. She was heart failure. Her heart wasn't pumping very good. Uh, she had high blood pressure. She had kidneys were going. Her liver was going. And she was a mess. And she was exhausted. And her copay for her medications was 20000 a year. So all we did was put her on essentially what is the 10-day plan in the Daniel Plan book. It's essentially what we've been using. But she stayed on it for more than 10 days, obviously. <laughs> if I call it the 10-year plan, people would never buy the book. So I had to call it the 10-day plan so people would buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> but truly it's it's a bait and switch model you know because people go oh i feel so good and then they're like i'm gonna stay on this i'm like good that's the whole point <laughs> and it, anyway she she was so miserable and was about to die really she was on her way to a heart transplant and a kidney transplant three days changing her diet to whole foods diet she got off her insulin in three months she got off all her meds her a1c which is a measure of your blood sugar was 11 which is really horrible like it means her blood sugars are running three four hundred every all the time and and within six weeks her blood sugars went to totally normal she didn't have diabetes anymore her heart failure reversed her kidneys got better her liver got better her blood pressure went to normal she got off all her medications in a year in a year this is what she looked like <laughs> oh my goodness so this is what happens when you change food so when i say when I say what's at the end of your fork is more powerful than what's in a prescription bottle, I'm not just being, you know, hyperbolic or, you know, overpromising. There is no drug that could take her from heart failure, kidney failure, diabetes, hypertension, and a number of other problems, angina, and, and get her off of all that and, and get her to look like this. There is no drug that can do that. It just doesn't exist. And yet food is that powerful. And yet we don't really think about it that way. And the reason most doctors don't see it is because they say, oh, just eat better, exercise more. And the patient goes home and goes, I don't know what that means. <laughs> you know, like, and, and there's no clear direction. And also doctors haven't, haven't seen, haven't seen it. They haven't ever witnessed the power of food because they don't know how to prescribe it. They don't know the dose. They don't know the medicine, literally the medicine that you need. Because not everybody needs the same medicine, right? Not everybody needs the same diet. It's about personalization. It's about food as medicine. That's really why I wrote 
Um, I mean, my book, The Peak and Diet, which is I've written enough books already, but I wrote this one because I think, you know, it, people need a simple, it's very it's skinny. It's like a skinny book. <laughs> uh, it, it's simple how-to guide on how to understand two fundamental principles around food that change everything. One, food is medicine. And two, nutrition needs to be personalized. And those two things are not something we really ever learned about in medical school. I love it. I have it right here. I have like devoured the book. I think it's so practical. I, Sean and I were talking, I think just that you cover 21 principles that really help you not only change, but sustain um, positive change with vibrancy of health for the long haul. It really gives you a philosophy of how to move forward with food a whole different type of relationship with food. Um, yeah. I love that you have guidelines. I love that there was a, um, Sam Gundry, um, Dr. Sam Gundry said, one of Mark's greatest attitudes is his ability to change his mind and advice when new evidence and studies prompt course correction. This ability is on display in the vegan diet where hard and fast rules give the way to savvy, doable guidelines for achieving optimal short and long-term health, to achieve optimal short and long-term health. It's great advice without the my way or the highway philosophy, what you think. So buy this book. So when you talk about personalization, that that's, a good, that's a good quote. <laughs> <laughs> the book. I know, but like, I don't read them. I'm like, oh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, but I love it. But Sean and I just devoured it. And I just want to say, you know, when you talk about locating imbalances, the food is medicine, let's personalize it. Tell us a little bit, what is your main food philosophy? I know you're not going to cover all 21 areas, but if you were to kind of summarize the main food philosophy of how to really obtain this optimal short-term and long-term health improvements, um, how would you I mean, substantiate it? It's really embarrassing because it's so obvious. It's not like there's some giant revelation. Don't eat junk and processed food. I mean, I always say there's no such thing as junk food. There's junk and there's food. So get rid of all processed food. I always said, you know, when I was talking at the Saddleback Church, I'd say, you know, it's really easy to figure out what to eat. When you pick it up, look at it and go, did God make this or did man make this? If God made it, you can eat it. If man made it, probably not, right? So did God make an avocado? Yeah. Did he make a Twinkie? No. <laughs> it's like even a three-year-old can understand that. So that's a really simple principle that I would start with. Eat real food. Eat only food. You know, when I go to the grocery store, what's in my cart is food. It's not stuff that you wouldn't recognize if you saw it at its original state on a farm somewhere, right? It's a vegetable. It's a fruit. It's a nut. It's a, I mean, you know, you, you, if you buy chicken or fish, you don't, you don't necessarily see the whole thing, but you know, you're not buying a cow, but you, you know, you, you know, it's just what it is. It doesn't have, a, it doesn't need a nutrition facts label or an ingredient list. There's no ingredients, right? It's not to say you can't eat stuff with ingredients. I do. Of course I do. You know, there's ingredients and things. I may have coconut yogurt. It's got coconut and probiotics and this and that. And whatever, like it's fine. But as long as you know what it is. Second principle is think of quality because, you know, aside from the two principles of food as medicine and personalized medicine, quality is a really important metric because not everything is the same. For example, uh, there's a great study according to the book about meat. If you look at kangaroo meat, and in Australia, they eat a lot of it. So they had actually, you know, a lot of it to study. Uh, and they compared people who ate kangaroo meat, the same amount of meat as regular feedlot factory farm meat. And they checked their biology, what happened. Even though it was ounce for ounce, the same amount of protein, you, you could, you know, you could analyze it as a macronutrient composition would be identical, but the information in the food was different. And the kangaroo meat, it reduced inflammation in the feedlot meat, it raised inflammation. And inflammation is associated with every single known disease. So it's meat is not meat is not meat. Same thing with, with anything. Grains are not grains are not grains. If you're eating a hybridized form of wheat, this is a great example. If you're eating, I, I just sort of use this example. If you're eating wheat that's grown in their modern conditions, which is hybridized wheat, that's dwarf wheat, super starch. So the sugar in that is worse than table sugar for your blood sugar. It's bred in a way that adds more gluten proteins in there. So you got way more gluten and way more inflammatory gluten proteins. Then they often spray it and harvest to dry it out with glyphosate. So there's a, a known biotoxin in the food that causes disruption of your microbiome. And then and they preserve it with calcium propionate, which causes behavioral and, and, and cognitive impairment in kids and adults too. 
So that's, that's our modern wheat. Now that grain is very different if you're gonna make pancakes from that. And in my book, I have a great pancake recipe. It's not like you don't get to have pancakes, right? Remember the pancake breakfast, we can go back to that at the church if it's the right pancakes. <laughs> and, uh, and these pancakes are the chai, they're chai buckwheat pancakes. Now you can use any buckwheat, but I, I found a buckwheat from the Himalayas, which is an ancient grain uh, that is grown in rough conditions because the plant's so stressed in its habitat because of local water and high altitude and temperatures and bad soil, it produces all these defense mechanisms. It's, all, it's like becomes more robust, right? If you, if you force somebody to, somebody to work hard, it's gonna become stronger. That's what we call hormesis. In other words, if you lift weights, you know, your muscles get injured, but then they get stronger, right? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger is the idea basically, right? And this plant has 132 phytochemicals it's much higher in protein than other grains, lower in starch and sugar, way more minerals like magnesium, zinc, and has 132 phytochemicals, which rejuvenate your immune system. So if you make pancakes from that versus regular flour, even if it's a cup of flour, it's very different. So same thing with vegetables. If you're eating a vegetable that's a wild strawberry, it's gonna be very different than you're eating a, some commercially raised strawberry, or like, so you go in the farmer's market and you get the local organic strawberries, and it's like, a, it's like a little thing, it's little, but it's like, Oh my God, it's like an explosion of flavor. And flavor, which is really the cool part, flavor correlates with the nutrient density of the food. Right? So if you, right. So all, the reason these plants taste good, right? If you eat, it, it, I don't know if you've ever done this, if you ever had a garden and you go pick an asparagus or pick broccoli and just eat it, it tastes profoundly different than you get in the store. Even if you buy, Organic, if it's been sitting on the shelf or whatever, because these degrade. And so phytochemicals are these, there's 25,000 of these. This is the medicines and food. These are the things that drive health or disease. If you don't have them, you get sick. If you have them, you say, well, so things that people know about this, like, oh, I'm having turmeric and curry, that's yellow spice, or I'm having broccoli and it's got, you know, glucosinolates, or I'm having red wine, it has resveratrol, or like people know about this a little bit, blueberries. Why should we eat blueberries? Because they're full of colorful pigments that are these phytochemicals and they have powerful healing properties. And if you're eating a wild blueberry, it's better than eating a regular organic blueberry, it's better than eating a commercial raised blueberry, right? So, and the taste and the taste of the wild blueberry would be so profoundly different. The taste of the wild strawberries are profoundly different. And the taste and the phytonutrients and the medicine all go together. So that's the good news. You get more tasty food. And, and Dan Barber from, um, who was an incredible chef in a lot of books. And he, he created a company called Row 7 Seeds where they're breeding plants for flavor, not for how much uh, shelf stability they have or how much starch they have or whether they, like, whether they look the right way. You know, it's like they're, they're breeding them for flavor. And that's what we should be thinking about. So, and then of course, you know, other principles are we should, we should be eating, you know, um, a plant rich diet. So lots, 80, 75, 80% of your plate should be plants. Like at night, I usually have two or three vegetable dishes, mushrooms, maybe sweet potato, a bunch of greens or something. And then you want to eat good fats, avocados, olive oil, nuts and seeds, good fatty fish. Uh, you want to make sure you're, you're eating grains. If you're eating grains uh, and you're not having, you know, issues, health issues, that you need to avoid them. But if you eat grains, make sure they're the right grains. Eat weird stuff, eat weird food. Like I went to the grocery store the other day and I bought cauliflower, but it was like, I'd never seen it before. It was like this purple, deep purple cauliflower thing. And I, I think it was cauliflower. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna eat this. It's weird food. So whenever I see weird food, I buy it. Like I was in Hawaii and I eat all these fruits I never ate before. I ate all these vegetables I never ate before. I'm like, oh, that's weird. I'm gonna eat that. Because when it's weird, it's often more likely to be in its sort of original state. It hasn't been highly... Uh, bread or all the good stuff left out of it. And so it's really important to eat that. So, and, and as far as protein goes, I think, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're thinking about our time of our life, what we're doing in our activities. So if you're younger and you're relatively healthy, you probably can do okay with a lot of plant proteins. But as you get older, you need more animal protein to synthesize muscle and build muscle. Um, and you need the quality of the protein, right? Meat isn't meat isn't meat. And, and it's the same thing. And you just have, like I said, with the kangaroo meat, you have to know the quality. Uh, and also uh, I am encourage people to personalize their nutrition, figure out what works for them, right? Don't let your ideology run over your biology. If you believe you should be vegan, but you feel like crap being a vegan, don't be a vegan, right? You know, if you stop having your period, if you're iron deficient, if you're vitamin D deficient, if you're tired and you're weak, 
and you wonder why you don't have energy, well, maybe it's not the right food for you. And so don't get hung up on your beliefs. Listen to your body. Your body is the smartest doctor in the room and it will tell you what you need. And then you experiment. So those are some of the basic principles. There's a lot of stuff in there about how to eat for mood, how to eat for your gut, how to eat for longevity, how to eat for a personalized approach to eating, how to find out what foods are you need. You know, all that's in the how to feed your kids. So th there's a how to eat for, you know, in affordable ways. It's high quality, but doesn't break the bank. So there's a lot of really practical stuff in the book. Yes, yeah, so I just want to say, get the book. You have a get the book. book. Get the book. Get the book. Get the book. Really, really, really book. Book. Get the book. You have a cookbook on the onion, the food. You have one about like what the heck should I eat? Another delicious cookbook. So make sure to get this. I just want to say you just shared a boatload of great information. I don't even I know. To begin to unpack all that. I just want to say a couple. Well, I, do. I just want to catch my breath. I could have gone on. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for you, Mark. I have a question. But I have to say one really quick comment. It just makes me motivated to get to the store. Like one thing about you, Dr. Hyman, is it's like you're so motivated because when you think about food as information, food mm. being giving you the power to heal, food, you know, with the gal that you showed making the, you know, being able to get off of all medication. It, it's really very motivating to say like, hey, I want a different relationship with food. I want to like start really looking at what I'm putting on the end of my fork. And I want to see it affect me, body, mind, and soul, body, mind, and spirit. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. So John, I'll just let you launch your question. But I just want to say like, it takes all of our bars up a notch, not in a negative way, like, oh, I've got to eat better, but like, oh my mm. gosh, I get to, I get to go to the store. I get to try something weird. I get to look at food as giving me information to heal. Yes. So yeah. I just want to say, yay, you know, <laughs> and I have so much more, but I'll let Sean get a word in edgewise here. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's, Mark, what you've done is so remarkable is you've just made nutrition simple. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what we love about this book and your philosophy and your research and everything that you do. Curious, you just talked about all the foods that you'd recommend and the principles you'd recommend. Are there any foods that you'd recommend that we stay away from? That we well, well, it was sort of what I said earlier, right? So the 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 thing that's not food. <laughs> I mean, anything goes when it comes to food. Even you know, like I would say, you know, people are like uh, extreme in some ways. And the whole point of the vegan diet is to get away from the extremism. There was a joke between paleo and vegan, right? The paleo guys are playing with the vegan guys, and they're all yelling at each other, and it's like worse than. Democrats and Republicans or Israelis and Palestinians, or, you know, it's like, it's terrible. And, and, and it's so unnecessary because, you know, when you look at the paleo and vegan world, they're actually identical except for where they get their protein. They both think we shouldn't have dairy, whole foods are good, and lots of nuts and seeds, good fats, except the only difference is grains or beans or animal food. That's it. Uh, and so uh, I think, I think I, I want people to understand that, that um, if you, if you're looking at what to avoid, it's essentially things that you wouldn't basically have in your cupboard. Like, do you have a bottle of high fructose corn syrup in your cupboard? No. Do you have butylated hydroxytoluene in your cupboard or BHT, which is a preservative in every processed food? Do you have MSG? Maybe you do. <laughs> Some people can buy MSG, but most of the stuff is like, why would I eat that? And so just look at the label and you go, oh, if it doesn't say tomato or salt or, you know, whatever, then don't eat it. The second thing I would say is that the, 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 the real concern I have, and, and this is a problem at, at Saddleback, was so many people are metabolically unhealthy. So what does that mean? Well, 88% of Americans, according to a new study, are metabolically unhealthy. That means 12% of Americans are metabolically healthy. Now, what does metabolically healthy mean? It means you have a normal blood sugar, a normal blood pressure, and a normal cholesterol. 12%. Okay, that was 88% are metabolic and healthy. And that, all those issues, blood sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol, abnormalities, are all the result pretty much of starch and sugar. So you're saying, what should I avoid? I would say, do I eat sugar? Of course I do. Uh, but it's, in the, it's a recreational drug. <laughs> you know? It's not an everyday, all day experience. And if you look at the way our culture is, we put sugar in everything. It's in breakfast cereal, which is 75% sugar. It's in salad dressing. Why would you put sugar in salad dressing? There's more sugar in your serving of tomato sauce that you get from the jar than there is in two Oreo cookies. 
<laughs> so it's everywhere. So be careful about sugar. It's the hidden sugar. It's not say what you add. It's what corporations add to your food. So and sugar is 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 a real problem. The second is, and the second is flour, because we eat every everything is flour in this country. It's mostly wheat. It's the, all the problems that I just talked about with wheat. But the the truth is that the wheat that we have now, as I mentioned earlier, raises your blood sugar more than table sugar. So if you think bagel bowl of sugar. You should be thinking identical, or maybe the bread, the bagel's worse. <laughs> okay, and people don't really get that. They go, "Oh, I'm having, you know, I'm having a piece of bread, or I'm having, you know, crackers, or I'm having pasta, or I'm having pizza, whatever it is." But it's so much. We eat 133 pounds a year per person of flour, and 152 pounds of sugar. That's almost a pound of flour and sugar a day. That's like that much flour and sugar per person. That's just not biologically feasible for us as humans. We really, we never had grains. We never had historically flour. If we found something, we'd be getting honey. I mean, like the Nepalese honey hunters, we'd have to climb a tree, risk our lives, you know, bring a branch of burning fire to smoke the bees out, get the honey, climb down. And then, you know, it was like, it was a project, you know, like if you, if you had to go, go get in a beehive and get your honey, Every time you, <laughs> that's fine, but that's okay. But it's really the amount and the volume. So I think sugar and starch are the real deadly ones. That's just so helpful. Okay, so I love that you talked about that 88% of people are metabolically unhealthy. And just by making some shifts with starch and sugar, you can see a profound impact for improving. We have seen that at RISE my whole time with the Danny plan, Sean's time in corporate wellness as well. But when you make a few shifts just in those areas alone, and on the positive side, I love the part of what to infuse. I love that you said, eat real food, focus on things that are nutrient dense, focus on the quality of food. But you said something that was interesting that I was really profoundly impacted by you upon first meeting you is you said eat 75% of your diet yeah. from um, like a plant rich diet. So what happened to me, I come from an Italian background. So maybe my plate might have looked like pasta, even if it was a healthy type of grain, even if it was mm -hmm. like some type of a specialized pasta, it might have been a big portion of that. Mm. And then it might have been um, maybe a meatball or two. And it might have been then a really teeny little salad or maybe a few string beans. That was what was kind of normal growing up, those type of ratios. Or maybe it would have been a big steak and a big mashed potato, and then a little bit of string beans or a little bit of the side salad. So what shifted for me with you is I could still do a pasta primavera and have a very small amount of like a quinoa type pasta with a really deliciously grass-fed meatball and then have three different types of vegetables. The, the shape of my plate started changing. Yeah. And I think you say, hey, you could have like roasted cauliflower, you could have a vegetable yeah. medley, you could do a stir fry. So now it's like, how many vegetables can I get on my plate starting with my morning? If I'm going to do a smoothie, a bowl with like spinach and chia and amazing low glycemic berries, or if I'm going to do a veggie scramble, or if I'm going to do dinner for breakfast. Now it's like, how much veggies can I get in each and every Yeah. Night? Yeah. I mean, like last night, you know, it doesn't have to take long. Like last night, I, I had um, a little piece of grass-fed steak, and but then I had to have like an extra, extra plates for my vegetables. <laughs> it went all thin on my plate. So I, I, I put a sweet potato in the oven before I went for my bike ride. So it takes about an hour. So I went for an hour, came back, my sweet potato was done. I chopped up some greens, some broccoli rob, and sliced some garlic. I, I'm kind of lazy. I got the peeled garlic, chopped it up, stir-fried. It takes about five minutes. The meat took about five minutes, maybe eight minutes. And then I sweet potato was done. And then I had some mushrooms that I threw in the oven. They were like shiitake mushrooms, just roasted mushrooms, some olive oil, salt and pepper. And it was like really quick and it didn't take me forever. And it, it was delicious. And I got three vegetable dishes and a little bit of meat. And that was my dinner. So I think, you know, that's what I do pretty much every night. I don't know what I'm having tonight, though, but I got a lot of vegetables. <laughs> it's a huge takeaway. And if I were to show you Sean and I's fridge right now, it would just be like stock. It's a huge, we've taken your food philosophy into our followers at Rise just to say, like, this is a beautiful way to eat. And it doesn't even have to be that hard. It actually can be 
not only nutrition made simple, but wellness made simple, but infusing like 75% of your plate. And I think your palate starts changing as you eliminate yeah. the sugar and the starch, where you start craving those things. And those things are so satisfying. It's just letting our palate get in alignment by ditching the starch and the sugar, giving them a mm. little break with a 10 day detox or what have you to really embrace all those great foods for you. Well, that's a very good point, Dee. I think, you know, most of us have, have, have our, our taste buds, our brain chemistry, our hormones, our metabolism, all been hijacked by the food industry. And I mean that like literally that the, the molecules in our body are driving us to crave and want the wrong things. And like you said, when you switch things out and you put in all the good stuff, quickly, everything resets. It doesn't take a long time, like literally days. And all of a sudden the cravings are gone. You're not hungry all the time. You're eating wanting the good stuff. Like I, I just, if I see a cookie, unless I'm like had a bad day or depressed, you know, I it doesn't look like food to me anymore. Mm-hmm. It doesn't call my name. Like I, I may, I, I don't deprive myself. Like if I, if I want some, I'll eat it. If I want to, you know, have French fries, I'll eat French fries. But like, it's just like, Oh, I don't want that. It makes me feel gross. It doesn't taste good. It's like, it doesn't like, it tastes awful. Like when you, I, I, I had a friend who's a, a nutritional psychologist and uh, and he worked at Kenya Ranch and he he met this guy. I love telling the story. He met this guy, came to the scene. He said, Look, I got to lose 50 pounds, but I don't really want to change my lifestyle. <laughs> and I'm just busy. And I, 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 what I do is I go and go to Burger King and I, I just order and I eat in the car and I go home because I'm busy and I have to work. But I'm like, He's like, Okay, well, go ahead and eat your big whoppers. But what I want you to do is I want you to get out of the car, I want you to go inside, I want you to sit down, and I want you to. Breathe deeply, and I want you to savor and chew every bite, and it was the best food you ever ate, and and enjoy it. And so he does that. He comes back. He goes, "It was disgusting. I couldn't eat it. It was terrible." <laughs> you know, because because people are often not even clued into what they're actually experiencing and yeah. how it actually tastes. I mean, I actually got in trouble once because I was in an airport. I was traveling, and I just. Usually I don't get in a food emergency. I have food with me, but I was on a lunch and I ran out or whatever happened. And I'm like, I had to go and eat. I was like, okay, I'm going to get like a chicken, like a chicken sandwich from McDonald's because they have like chicken breast. And I'm like going to try that. And I, I don't know what they do to their chicken breast, what they inject into it or what they do to it. But it was like the worst tasting thing ever. It was like super salty, and all these weird flavors. Like they were artificial. And I'm like, this is awful. And, and I, I just really couldn't eat it. So I think, I think, you know, we, if we really tune into what our bodies want, they start to want the right things. Mm-hmm. Like you want exercise, you want to eat the right food, you want to get enough sleep. And, and mo- you know, what strikes me so much, Dean and Sean, is as a doctor doing this for, God, almost, ugh, scary now, uh, almost 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's hard to say. Um, that that um, most people don't connect the dots between how they feel and what they eat. Yeah. And they don't know how bad they feel until they start feeling good. Mm, interesting. And, and I'm like, this is normal. It's normal to be achy when I get up. It's normal to have post nasal drip. It's normal to have headaches. It's normal to have bloating. It's normal to, my skin's not so good. It's normal to whatever. Like, it's just, none of that's normal. Those are all signs of imbalance that are often caused by food. Now, it's not the only thing. People can get toxins. They can get infections like Lyme disease. People can get you know, allergies. There's, there's stuff that happens to people that's it's not their fault, right? Like me, I'm a great example of that. I, I had mercury from China. I had mold in my house. I got Lyme disease. None of those were lifestyle diseases, right? I got all this stuff. And of course, then, then my, my thing is I have to figure it out so I can get better. Then I have to treat everybody else and tell them how to get better. <laughs> but I, I don't wish that job on anybody. I think I, hopefully I'm done. But I think I keep, I keep going because I had back surgery and I have to figure out actually how to get a back pain for the first time in 30 years. So it's really, uh, I learn every day. Well, I love that you uh, you help all, all of us learn with what you um, have researched, what you've experienced. And I feel like your journey has been so profound and has had this ripple effect of goodness for those of us really around the nation and the world with you spreading the good news of really how to integrate this as a lifestyle. So thinking of everything we've experienced over the last year and a half, if you were to say some kind of next health steps for 
those of us really wanting to strengthen our immune system, to improve our state of well-being? I know that's a very broad question, but I think I'd love to know, like, what are some next steps that you see? We already know now what to do in our eating life. What are some other lifestyle approaches that you would think or anything else you'd like to say on strengthening the immune system and adding in mental well-being as well? Sure. You know, I think food is food is relatively easy in a sense because it's circumscribed. Some of the other things are harder. I, I would say you have to figure out what works for you. And for me, I figured out like, like today, uh, I just I sort of do have my routine, which I try to do. So I had a, I had a, uh, uh, woke up, I, I journaled because that really helps me get grounded. I wake up, I, I put some nice music on, I sit by myself and I just feel what I'm feeling and feel it's coming up for the day. And I kind of just, just sort of, whether I'm happy or sad or I'm learning something, I'm always learning something. So that helps me get grounded. And then I, um, I have, my, I have my workout with my trainer, which I do on Zoom. And then I, I use this new thing called TV 12 Sports, which is awesome. It's 30 minutes, it's $50, super affordable. And I do that. And then I um, then I, I had a bike ride. And, um, and I'll do meditation after this, this conversation. I took a steam uh, and I worked and I worked in between. So I just designed it so I can work and do my thing. So it's not like I'm not working, but I, I basically have designed the, the things that help to support my health. And I'll make sure I I wind down tonight. I don't uh, watch my screens. I read and maybe take a bath and have a quiet evening and then and get into bed and go to bed and have a good eight hours sleep. And so those those are my tools. And I take my supplements and I and I just make sure I also build community. So I'm always connected with my friends. I'm talking on the phone or FaceTime. Uh, even if I'm like by myself, which I'm now, or if I'm, you know, you know, having the opportunity, I'll go be with a group of friends that really supports me and loves me and nourishes me. So it's all those pieces. And we have to build community and relationships. We have to build our movement habits. We have to build our sleep habits, our, our ways of handling stress. And I think, you know, for most people, life is just very stressful. <laughs> so you have to, you have to actively work to mitigate that by looking at your thoughts and your inner dialogue by by looking at you know well, the beliefs and things you have, um, there's a lot of tools for that. I think there's a lot of tools for that. You know, Mark, it's interesting as you were talking about the 10-day approach. This idea of trying something for 10 days. We have a client of ours that followed your philosophy for 10 days and continued, like you mentioned, the 10 days. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Oh. No worries. <laughs> You need to get that? No. <laughs> I just, I, I feel bad because it's on my computer. It just goes off. So the person just followed your approach, your detox for 10 days and kept going because he felt so good. Now he's 200 pounds down, Mark, which is wow. unbelievable, right? Like the picture you showed. And it just makes me think about if you were to recommend the first step, like what would be the first step you'd recommend for folks, especially it's been such a crazy year, so much stress, so much going on, it, it physically, emotionally. If there were one thing that, and I know it would probably vary for each person, but is well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote uh, one of our favorite people, uh, Pastor Rick Warren, uh, who says, "Every body needs a buddy. Every body needs a buddy." My version is, "Getting healthy is a team sport." So I would just find one person. Just one person, or maybe if you have a small group, it can be just one person and, and, and be on the journey with them, walk with them, bring them, invite them over to cook with you, go shopping together, you know, talk, you know, start a, a little meditation group, whatever, whatever is, is, is lighting you up, get support because doing it on your own is hard and it can, it can be using rise. It can be being in a faith-based uh, small group. Uh, it can be like we have a Cleveland clinic doing group models for shared medical appointments. It can be an online coaching program like Vita or Berta for diabetes. So there's all sorts of opportunities to get people connected. But, but you know, doing it on your own is hard. Life is not meant to be lived solo. I mean, we are social creatures and we need that intimacy and connection in order to inspire us. So I, I, that's, a, that's an important piece of advice. And the other thing is if you're going to do one thing, and you want to do one thing and, and make a big difference, just stop starch and sugar. <laughs> just do it for a month 
and see what happens. How do you feel? And that means flour and sugar. And even, you know, potatoes and rice and all that stuff. Like just see if you can use what happens. Because most people have never done that as an experiment. And if you want to go crazy, you can just also, um, you know, you can, you can also take out dairy because some people are reactive to dairy and then add in, try to add in some veggies. And, you know, it doesn't have to be hard, but, you know, uh, green smoothies are great. You can, if you don't like, if you don't want to cook veggies, you can just throw everything in the blender, you know, Vitamix. And then, you know, I throw avocados, olive oil, greens, you know, stuff, anything in there. And it'll all turn into like soup basically. And then you can just drink it. And that's a great way to get your veggies. That's very motivating and very doable. Just to feel like, okay, if there's one thing, I'm going to grab a buddy. I'm going to connect here at Rise. I'm going to connect to the community with family. I'm going to check out something online, whatever is a good match. And then to say for food, I'm just going to like ditch the sugar and starch and I'm going to start adding in the veggies. Just that simple shift um, is so profound. It takes down the inflammation, the cravings, all of it. I love that you also said, Mark, um, what your routine was like. That you said, hey, like I have community, I'm gonna do some meditation, I did some strength work with my routine, my fitness routine. I look at sleep habits, I look at kind of my nighttime routine. You taught us early on with the Daniel plan about AM PM routine and protecting the bookends of your day. Brian Johnson, a coaching coach and program I did for a couple of years, really focused on AM PM routine as well. You also said, like, be so clear on what energizes you. Like whatever energizes you for your AM routine and PM routine, like put those things in. So I just think, you know, the food is such a huge part of all of it. And then these lifestyle practices make a great foundation of how do I complement things with, that really energize my life in these areas. And you've been such an example. I think one time you said after a bad day, you're like, well, D, I just reboot. You know, I've had a bad day. I go on my mountain bike. I get out in nature. I come back, maybe do a little sauna. Then I cook a great dinner. And I was like, I can do that. I can turn my day around yeah. with a few simple practices. Yeah, I mean, I just like just to be transparent. So uh, the day before yesterday, I had a really stressful, emotional day. And um, I was I didn't sleep that great. And I was kind of tired the next day and I did a few things. And so I was like feeling down and just crappy. So I, you know, my, my work day got done and like, and I about four o'clock and I meditated. Uh, and I got all my energy back, and then I went for a nice bike ride in the afternoon, late afternoon, came back, put the sauna on, gave myself some love, made a nice dinner, and just my whole, my whole, I changed my whole state. And I think this is a really interesting concept that most people don't get, which is how can you change your state? If you're sad, if you're tired, if you're sore, if you're frustrated, if you're angry, if you're whatever, hurt, how do you change your state? And I think it's a it's 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 something we have access to and there are tools to do that tony robbins talks about it you know uh it could be just deep breathing it could be you know doing 50 jumping jacks or burpees it could be taking a walk in the woods it could be taking a bath it could be you know calling a friend it could be you know giving yourself a foot massage it could be whatever whatever you know you've got to figure out how to change your state i know how to change my state one of my favorite ways is a sauna or steam and an ice bath like if i do that whatever I'm stressed or I'm worried, it's like, it just changes my physiological state. You know, ice cold shower in the morning. I love that. It's like a change of state. So I wake up, I'm like, oh, I'm like, I'm like jump in the ice cold shower. It's like, oh, this is, this is really good. Not, a, not even need my coffee. So. <laughs> That's like perfect. I think when you talk about things that energize your life, you feel like we actually have a hold the key in our hand to change our state. I feel like uh, we can have anything happen, any stress, Stress is gonna hit, it's inevitable. So to have some tools in our back pocket that we know we can pull out each and every time that really work for each one of us, mm -hmm. you know, is invaluable. We say at Rise, the day you need to mostly stick to your protocol, the, the things that really energize you is on your worst day. Because on your best day, you really are doing fine. It's on the worst days, it's like, hey, wait a minute, let me just get out in nature for a little bit for me. Let me take a short walk. Let me infuse with some amazing food. Call a friend, maybe journal. Those. Yeah. Are what energized me but i know that i know that better than anything when i hit the slump i have a bad phone call i have a bad interaction or just the weight of life is stressful and heavy those things really matter so i think for Thank those you. Watching, you just identify those energizers and when it comes to food mark i just want to say 
one thing in closing, and then I'll, I'll let Sean add a final note and comment. This is one of my favorite quotes that you gave us back in the Daniel Plan days, and I put over and over and over. And I think it's a blessing just to share it. It says, the reason to eat real food is not just to fit into your jeans or to look good in a dress, but to be awake, to be awake to the beauty and the miracle of life, to be able to live with purpose, to love, to serve, to connect and to celebrate the gifts that God has given you. Did I say that? Yes, you did. <laughs> oh, dude. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. I'll buy into that. I agree with that. I yeah, agree with I that. I just want to say, get the vegan diet. <laughs> There's so much beauty to be awake to the beauty and miracle of life. These principles are invaluable. And I'm wondering what is the best way for people to connect with you? They can obviously. Um, yeah. Grab your book, and then you have so much during the week with Mark Six and everything else. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, the basic go to my website, drhyman.com. There's a lot there. I have uh, Mark's Picks you can sign up for, which is a weekly newsletter that gives you all my favorite stuff and how to get healthy. You can join Dr. Hyman Plus, which is a subscription service for a year where we do a question and answer like this every month. We do a deep dive in functional medicine. You get free access to my uh, all my documentaries and ad free podcasts. You can check out my podcast, which is uh, Doctor's Pharmacy, which is great, and and I think uh, and my social media, which is Doctor Mark Hyman, Dr. Mark Hyman, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and then you know there's plenty there, <laughs> and I think there's a lot of great content we put out every week. I, I do a lot of deep dives at health issues on Fridays with my doctors at the Ultra Wellness Center. We go into really deep dives around how do you approach irritable bowel, or reflux, or infertility, or migraines, or depression, or whatever, whatever it is, we go way into it and help people navigate. And it's really, it's really satisfying. So that's how you can find me. That sounds perfect. Oh, Sean, you're on mute. I was just saying, uh, we just want to encourage everyone to check out Dr. Hyman's work. And Mark, can I just say, um, on behalf of Dee and myself and thousands and millions of people um you have helped so many oh thank you thank you you have mark and i know um all the research all the work all the studying all the writing all all the work that you've done i was going to ask you in closing mark if you had a wish for 2022 right if you had a wish and d kind of read it she read your wish it sounds so beautiful your blessing for all of us and but um any closing thoughts, Mark, from, from your end? I mean, I, 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 I think, uh, you know, how I, I feel about this whole COVID um, this disaster that's happened to humanity is, is that it's sort of God's way of giving humans time out. So you guys need to go to your room, <laughs> stay inside, and figure out what doesn't work about your life and what does. And get rid of the things that don't work and invite in the things that do work. And I've certainly done that. I, I realized that, you no, know, I, I mean, I'm like everybody else. Like I, I during COVID, I, I stayed home and it was the first time I've been off the road in 30 years. And I literally didn't get on a plane, get in a bus, car, train. And it changed my life because I realized I was running my machine so hard that it wasn't good for me. And I was trying to help everybody else, but it wasn't good for me. And so I, I think I encourage everybody to just like look at their life and go, you know, we don't want to go back to normal. <laughs> normal wasn't good. <laughs> you know, we won't, we won't. So, so I would invite everybody to find ways to slow down, to connect to what matters to their community, their family, their purpose, to connect to their bodies. And if I had one wish, it would be, it would be that. Oh, that's beautiful. We love you so much. We're so thankful eternally grateful and sentimental even just saying it because your work is so profound and your love honestly has just been so far reaching because Uh, not just your work and your research and your brilliance because you are all of that but you deliver it with such love and care and tenderness so i just want to say thank you oh dave thank you i love you guys so much i miss you this is terrible let's get back together we need to put the band back together (laughs) back together thank you so much you guys enjoy enjoy everything on the site Enjoy getting his book. And just once again, thank you so much, Mark. You're amazing. Thank you, guys. Wow. Oh, my goodness.
He's so great, isn't he? I mean, I loved all the chat that's been going on. There was so many key takeaways. I think the bottom line is that we can all have a different relationship to food, that he does really wind it down in his numerous books, his latest, The Pegan Diet, we really highly recommend. We do build our foundational nutritional principles on this in our um, the programs that we offer here at RISE. And it's so fantastic just to know that food is medicine and food can heal us. And I would just say, stay connected. Oh, I see Chef Jenny Ross is in the house. So Jenny, you're the perfect one to say food is medicine because we just had this awesome hour with Mark, you know, just talking about the healing and transformative nature of food. And he broke it down into so many practical areas of getting away from extremism and just focusing on the basics. If it was grown on a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't, <laughs> right? It is so good. Jenny, we were so excited about your segment. We were just closing up Dr. Hyman's. D, a couple of things that really, really, I mean, I've got so, you know, taking so many notes from just our interview with him. I mean, I love what he said in closing. I thought, I love this, D. Focus on what works and what doesn't work. I mean, the simplicity of that, like what is it that we're doing in our lives that's just not working, right? He talked about how COVID is really, impacted us and how some things we need to learn. And I just love the simplicity and you emphasize this deep, stopping the sugar and the starch. Like we have seen lives transformed just by doing that simple step of um, stopping the sugar and the starch. And I think more, when he quoted Rick, Rick Warren, when he said, everybody needs a buddy. I mean, that is ringing true. I think for every expert that we're talking with the, is that we're so much stronger together. Mm -hmm. You know, so Jenny, we're fired up to have you. We're going to take a, just a one minute break because Dee's going to stop her recording. Then I'm going to record you. But um, while we're doing that, Dee, I'll let you say goodbye in this segment. But stay with us, guys, because Jenny's going to be kicking us off. And has, oh, she looks like she has some fun stuff for us to share. So, yeah, I just want to say I'm super excited to have Jenny come on the back end of Dr. Hyman, because um, Sean, we'll tell a little bit about her background in a moment, but I just want to say Jenny um, has a wealth of background in nutrition. She's been in the field for over 20 years. She has several best-selling books out. She travels the world speaking on nutrition. She's with TriBest, which is an amazing company, and she is our chief nutrition expert at RISE. I had the pleasure of serving with her at the Daniel Plan as one of our signature chefs at the Daniel Plan. But I think what great timing, we decided to put her right after Mark Hyman, because Mark talked about all the principles and how fun now just to be able to jump and take a deep dive into yeah. Jenny's kitchen and be able to see some of the magic of how she makes us come alive. So with that, I'm going to stop recording this session.